Chapter 19. Drifting Towards Disunion. 1854-1861. to 1861. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. Abraham Lincoln, 1854. The slavery question continued to churn the cauldron of controversy throughout the 1850s. As moral temperatures rose, prospects for a peaceful political solution to the slavery issue simply evaporated. Kansas Territory erupted in violence between pro-slavery and anti-slavery factions in 1855. Two years later, the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision invalidated the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had imposed a shaky lid on the slavery problem for more than a generation. Attitudes on both sides progressively hardened. When, in 1860, the newly formed Republican Party nominated for president Abraham Lincoln, an outspoken opponent of the further expansion of slavery, the stage was set for all-out civil war. Stowe and Helper, Literary Incendiaries Sectional tensions were further strained in 1852 and later by an inky phenomenon. Harriet Beecher Stowe, a wisp of a woman and the mother of a half-dozen children, published her heart-rendering novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Dismayed by the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, she was determined to awaken the North to the wickedness of slavery by laying bare its terrible inhumanity, especially the cruel splitting of families. Her wildly popular book relied on powerful imagery and touching pathos. God wrote it, she explained in year, later years, a reminder that the deeper sources of her anti-slavery sentiment lay in the evangelical religious crusades of the Second Great Awakening. The success of the novel, at home and abroad, was sensational. Several hundred thousand copies were published in the first year, and the total soon ran into the millions as the tale was translated into more than a score of languages. It was also put on the stage in Tom shows for lengthy runs. No other novel in American history, perhaps in all of history, can be compared with it as a political force. To millions of people, it made slavery appear almost as evil as it really was. When Mrs. Stowe was introduced to President Lincoln in 1862, he reportedly remarked with twinkling eyes, so you're the little woman who wrote that book that made this great war. The truth is that Uncle Tom's Cabin did help start the Civil War and win it. The South condemned that vile wretch in petticoats when it learned that hundreds of thousands of fellow Americans were reading and believing her unfair indictment. Mrs. Stowe had never witnessed slavery at first hand in the Deep South, but she had seen it briefly during a visit to Kentucky, and she had lived for many years in Ohio, a center of underground railroad activity. Uncle Tom, endearing and enduring, left a profound impression on the North. Uncounted thousands of readers swore that henceforth they would have nothing to do with the enforcement of this fugitive slave law. The tale was devoured by millions of impressionable youths in the 1850s, some of whom later became boys in blue who volunteered to fight the Civil War through to its grim finale. The memory of a beaten and dying Uncle Tom helped sustain them in their determination to wipe out the plague of slavery. The novel was immensely popular abroad, especially in Britain and France. Countless readers wept over the kindly Tom and angelic Eva while deploring their brutal Simon Legree. When the guns in America finally began to boom, the common people of England sensed that the triumph of the North would spell the end of the Black Curse. The governments in London and Paris seriously considered intervening in behalf of the South, but they were sobered by the realization that many of their own people, aroused by Tom mania, might not support them. Another trouble-brewing book appeared in 1857, five years after the debut of Uncle Tom. Titled The Impending Crisis of the South, it was written by Hinton R. Helper, a non-aristocratic white from North Carolina. Hating both slavery and blacks, he attempted to prove by an array of statistics that indirectly the non-slaveholding whites were the ones who were suffering most from the millstone of slavery. Unable to secure a publisher in the South, he finally managed to find one in the North. Helper's influence was negligible among the poor whites to whom he had addressed his message. His book, with its dirty illusions, was banned in the South, where book-burning parties were held. But in the North, untold thousands of copies, many in condensed form, were distributed as campaign literature by Republicans. Southerners were f further embittered when they learned that their Northern brethren were spreading these wicked lies. Thus did Southerners, reacting much as they did to Uncle Tom's Cabin, become increasingly unwilling to sleep under the same federal roof with their hostile Yankee bedfellows. The North-South Contest for Kansas, 1857-1861 to 
The rolling plains of Kansas had meanwhile been providing an example of the worst possible workings of popular sovereignty, although admittedly under abnormal conditions. Newcomers who ventured into Kansas were a motley lot. Most of the northerners were just ordinary westward-moving pioneers in search of richer lands behind the sunset. But a small part of the inflow was financed by groups of northern abolitionists, or free soilers. The most famous of these anti-slavery organizations was the New England Emigrant Aid Company, which sent about 2,000 people to the troubled area to forestall the South, and also to make a profit. Shouting, Ho for Kansas, many of them carried the deadly new breech-loading sharps rifles, nicknamed Breacher's Bibles, after the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, Harry Beecher Stowe's brother, who had helped raise money for their purchase. Many of the Kansas-bound pioneers sang Whittier's marching song in 1854. We crossed the prairies as of old, the pilgrims crossed the sea, to make the west as they the east, the homestead of the free. Southern spokesmen, now more than ordinarily touchy, raised furious cries of betrayal. They had supported the Kansas-Nebraska scheme of Douglas with the unspoken understanding that Kansas would be the slave and Nebraska would be free. The northern Nebraskals, alleged by foul means, were now apparently out to abolitionize both Kansas and Nebraska. A few southern hotheads, quick to respond in kind, attempted to assist small groups of well-armed slave owners to, the, to Kansas. Some carried banners proclaiming, Let Yankees tremble, abolitionists fall, our motto is, give southern rights to all. But planting blacks on Kansas soil was a losing game. Slaves were valuable and volatile property, and foolish indeed were owners who would take them where bullets were flying and where the soil might be voted under free popular sovereignty. The census of 1860 found only two slaves among 107,000 souls in all of Kansas Territory, and only 15 in Nebraska. There were much truth in the charge that the whole quarrel over slavery in the territories revolved around an imaginary Negro in an impossible place. Crisis conditions in Kansas worsened, rapidly worsened, when the day came in 1855 to elect members of the first territorial legislature, pro-slavery border ruffians poured in from Missouri to vote early and often. The slavery supporters triumphed and then set up their own puppet government at Shawnee Mission. The Free Soilers, unable to stomach this fraudulent conspiracy, established an extra-legal regime of their own in Topeka. The confused Kansas, Kansans thus had their choice between two governments, one based on fraud, the other on illegality. Tensions mounted as settlers also feuded over conflicting land claims. The breaking point came in 1856 when a gang of pro-slavery raiders allegedly pro, uh, alleging pro, uh, provocation shot up and burned a part of the free soil town of Lawrence. This outrage was but the prelude to a bloodier tragedy. Kansas in Convulsion The fanatical figure of John Brown now stalked upon the Kansas battlefield. Spare, gray-bearded, and iron-willed, he was obsessively dedicated to the abolitionist cause. The power of his glittering gray eyes was such, so he claimed, that his stare could force a dog or cat to slink out of the room. Becoming involved in dubious dealings, including those horse stealing, he moved to Kansas from Ohio with a part of his large family. Brooding over the recent attack on Lawrence, Old Brown of Osawatomie led a band of his followers to Potawatomi Creek in 1856. There, they literally hacked to pieces five surprised men, presumed to be pro slaverites This fiendish butchery, clearly the product of a deranged mind, besmirched the free soil cause and brought vicious retaliation from pro-slavery forces. Civil war in Kansas, which thus flared forth in 1856, continued intermittently until it merged with a larger-scale civil war of 1861 to 1865. Altogether, the Kansas conflict destroyed millions of dollars' worth of property, paralyzed agricultural in certain areas, and cost scores of lives. Yet, by 1857, Kansas had enough people, chiefly free soilers, to apply for statehood on a popular sovereignty basis. The pro-slavery forces, then in saddle, devised a tricky document known as the Lecompton Constitution. The people were not allowed to vote for or against the Constitution as a whole, but for the Constitution either with slavery or with no slavery. If they voted against slavery... One of the remaining provisions of the Constitution would protect the owners of slaves already in Kansas. So whatever the outcome, there would still be black bondage in Kansas. Many free soilers, infuriated by this ploy, boycotted the polls. Left themselves, the pro-slaveryites approved the Constitution with slavery in late 1857. The scene next shifted to Washington. President Pierce had been succeeded by the no less pliable James Buchanan, who was also strongly under... <coughs> 
uh, the Southern influence. Blind to the sharp divisions within his own Democratic Party, Buchanan threw weight, the weight of his administration behind the notorious Lecompton Constitution. But Senator Douglas, who had championed true popular sovereignty, would have none of this semi-popular fraudulency. Deliberately tossing away his strong support in the South for the presidency, he fought courageously for fair play and democratic principles. The outcome was a compromise that, in effect, submitted the entire Lecompton Constitution to a popular vote. The Free Soilers voted, thereupon, thronged to the polls, and snowed it under. Kansas remained a territory until 1861, when the Southern Secessionists left Congress. President Buchanan, by agonizing the numerous Douglas Democrats in the North, hopelessly divided the once powerful Democratic Party. Until then, it had been the only remaining national party. For the Whigs were dead, and the Republicans were sectional they were in the North. With the disruption of the Democrats came the snapping of one of the last important strands in the rope that was barely binding the Union together. So the Democratic Party now is split North-South, Douglas Democrats in the North, Buchanan supporters in the South, and the Republican Party, which is a strictly Northern Party, so now you don't have any more national parties binding the North and South together. Mostly because of Kansas. Bully Brooks and his bludgeon. Bleeding Kansas also splattered blood on the floor of the Senate in 1856. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, a tall and imposing figure, was a leading abolitionist, one of the few prominent in political life. Highly educated but cold, humorless, intolerant, and egotistical, he had made himself one of the most disliked, disliked men in the Senate. Brooding over the turbulent miscarriage of popular sovereignty, he delivered a blistering speech titled The Crime Against Kansas. Sparing few epithets, he condemned the pro-slavery men as, quote, hirelings picked from the drunken spew and vomit of an uneasy civilization. He also referred insultingly to South Carolina and its white-haired Senator Andrew Butler, one of the best-liked members of the Senate. Hot-tempered Congressman Preston S. Brooks of South Carolina now took vengeance into his own hands. Ordinarily gracious and gallant, he resented the insults to his state and to its senator, a distant cousin. His code of honor called for a duel, but in the South, one fought only with one's social equals, and had not the coarse language of the Yankee, who probably would reject the challenge, dropped him in the lower order. To Brooks, the only alternative was to chastise the senator as one who would beat an unruly dog. On May 28, 1856, he approached Sumner, then sitting at his Senate desk, and pounded the order with the, an 11-pound cane until it broke. The victim fell bleeding and unconscious to the floor, while several nearby senators refrained from interfering. Sumner had been provocatively insulting, but the counter-outrage put Brooks in the wrong. The House of Representatives could not muster enough votes to expel the South Carolinian, but he resigned and was triumphantly re-elected. Southern admirers deluged Brooks with canes, some of them gold, gold-headed to replace the one that had been broken. The injuries to Sumner's head and nervous system were serious. He was forced to leave his seat for three and a half years and go to Europe for treatment that was both painful and costly. Meanwhile, Massachusetts Lee defiantly re-elected him, leaving his seat eloquently empty. Bleeding Sumner was thus joined with the bleeding Kansas as a political issue. The Free Soil North was mightily aroused against the uncouth and cowardly Bully Brooks. Copies of Sumner's abuse of speech, otherwise doomed to obscurity, were sold by the tens of thousands. Everywhere, every blow that struck the senator doubtless made thousands of Republican votes. The South, although not unanimous in approving Brooks, was angered not only because Sumner had been made such an intemperate speech, but because it had been so extravagantly applauded in the North. The Sumner-Brooks clash and the ensuing reaction revealed how dangerously inflamed passions were becoming, North and South. It was ominous that the cultured Sumner should have used the language of a barroom bully and that the gentlemanly Brooks should have employed the tactics of tools of a thug. Emotion was displacing thought. The blows rained on Sumner's head were, broadly speaking, among the first blows of the Civil War. Old Buck versus the Pathfinder With bullets whining in Kansas, the Democrats met in Cincinnati, to nominate their presidential standard-bearer of 1856. They shied away from both the weak-kneed President Pierce and the dynamic Douglas. Each was too indelibly tainted by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The delegates finally chose James Buchanan, pronounced by many as Buchanan, who was a muscular, white-haired and tall, six feet, with a short neck and a protruding chin. Because of an eye defect, he carried his head cocked to one side. A well-to-do Pennsylvania lawyer, he had been serving as a minister to London during the recent Kansas-Nebraska uproar. He was therefore Kansasless and hence relatively enemyless. 
But in a crisis that called for giants, old Buck Buchanan was mediocre, ir irresolute, and confused. Delegates of the fast-growing Republican Party met in Philadelphia with bubbling enthusiasm. Higher Law Seward was their most conspicuous leader, and he probably would have arranged to win the nomination had he been, a, had he been confident that this was a Republican year. The final choice was Captain John C. Fremont, the so-called Pathfinder of the West, a dashing but erratic explorer-soldier-surveyor who was supposed to find the path to the White House. The black-beard and flashy young adventurer was virtually without political experience, but like Buchanan, he was not tarred with the Kansas brush. The Republican platform came out vigorously against the extension of slavery into the territories, while the Democrats declared no less emphatically for popular sovereignty. An ugly dose of anti-foreignism was injected into the campaign, even though slavery extension loomed largest. The recent influx of immigrants from Ireland and Germany had alarmed nativists, as many of the old stock Protestants were called. They organized the American Party, known also as the Know-Nothing Party, because of its secretness and in 1856 nominated the lackluster ex-president Millard Fillmore. Anti-foreign and anti-Catholic, these super patriots adopted the slogan, Americans must rule America. Remnants of the dying Whig party likewise endorsed Fillmore, and they and the know-nothings threatened to cut the Republican Party's strength. Republicans fell in behind Fremont, fell in behind Fremont with the zeal of crusaders, shouting, We follow the Pathfinder, and we are buck-hunting. They organized glee clubs, which sang to the tune of the Marseille, Arise, arise, ye brave, and let out or cry he. Free speech, free press, free soil, free men, free mont and victory. And free love, sneered the Buchanan supporters, buccaneers. Munslinging bespattered both candidates. Old fogey, Buchanan, was assailed because he was a bachelor. The fiancé of his youth had died after a Lovell's quarrel. Fremont was reviled because of his illegitimate birth, for his young mother had left her elderly husband, a Virginia planter, to run away with a French adventurer. In, su in due season, she gave birth to John in Savannah, Georgia, further to shame the South. More harmful, more harmful to Fremont was the allegation which alienated many benighted know-nothings, I'm sorry, begot bigoted know-nothings and other nativists that he was a Roman Catholic. The Electoral Fruits of 1856 A bland Buchanan, although polling less than a majority in the popular vote, won handily. His tally in the Electoral College was 174 to 114 for Fremont, with Fillmore garnering 8. The popular vote was 1,832,955 for Buchanan to 1,339,932 for Fremont and 871,731 for Fillmore. Why did the rousing Republicans go down in defeat? Fremont lost much ground because of the grave doubts to, as to his honesty, capacity, and sound judgment. Perhaps more damaging were the violent threats of the Southern Fire Eaters that the election of a sectional black Republican would be a de declaration of war on them, forcing them to secede. Many Northerners, anxious to save both the Union and their profitable business connections with the South, were thus intimidated into voting for Buchanan. Innate conservatism triumphed, assisted by the so-called Southern bullyism. Just to make it clear, when they call Fremont a black Republican, he's not really actually African American. He uh, is just known to be against the support of slavery spreading, so they they tarnished him with that name back then. It was popular. No, it was probably fortunate for the Union that se secession and civil war did not come in 1856, following a Republican victory. Fremont, an ill-balanced and second-rate figure, was no Abraham Lincoln, and in 1856 the North was more willing to let the South depart in peace than in 1860. Dramatic events from 1856 to 1860 were to arouse hundreds of thousands of still apathetic Northerners to a fighting pitch. Yet the Republicans in 1856 could rightfully claim a victorious defeat. The new party, a mere two-year-old toddler had made an astonishing showing against the well-oiled democratic machine. Whittier exulted, Then sound again the bugles, call the muster, roll anew. If months have well nigh won the field, what may not four years do? The election of 1856 cast a long shadow forward, and politicians, north and south, peered anxiously towards 1860. The Dred Scott Bombshell The Dred Scott Decision, handed down by the Supreme Court on March 6, 1856, abruptly ended the two-day presidential honeymoon of the unlucky bachelor James Buchanan. The pronouncement was one of the opening paper gun blasts of the Civil War.
Basically, the case was simple. The Dred Scott, a black slave, had lived with his master for five years in Illinois and Wisconsin Territory. Backed by inter interested abolitionists, he sued for freedom on the basis of his long residence on free soil. The Supreme Court proceeded to twist a simple legal case into a complex political issue. It ruled, not surprisingly, that Dred Scott was a black slave and not a citizen, and hence could not sue in federal courts. The tribunal could then have thrown out the case on these technical grounds alone, but a majority decided to go further, under the leadership of the emaciated Justice Chief, Chief Justice Taney from the slave state of Maryland. A sweeping judgment on the larger issue of slavery in the territories seemed desirable, particularly to forestall arguments by two free soil justices who were preparing dissenting opinions. The pro-slavery majority evidently hoped in this way to lay the odious question to rest. Taney's thunderclap rocked the free soilers back on their heels. A majority of the court decreed that because a slave was a private property, he or she could not be I'm sorry, could be taken into any territory and legally held there in slavery. The reasoning was that the Fifth Amendment made clearly clearly forbade Congress to deprive people of their property without due process of law. The court, to be consistent, went further. The Missouri Compromise, banning slavery north of the 3630 line, had been repealed three years earlier by the Kansas Nebraska Act, but its spirit was still, was still venerated in the North. Now the court ruled that the Compromise of 1820 had been unconstitutional all along. Congress had no power to ban slavery from territories, regardless even of what the territorial legislators themselves might want. Southerners were delighted with this unexpected victory. Champions of popular sovereignty were aghast, including Senator Douglas and a host of Northern Democrats. Another lethal wedge was thus driven between the Northern and Southern wings of the once united Democratic Party. Foes of slavery extension, especially the Republicans, were infuriated by the Dred Scott decision. Their chief rallying cry had been the banishing of bondage from the territories. They now insisted that the ruling of the Supreme Court was merely an opinion, not a decision, and no more binding than the views of the Southern Debating Society. Republican defiance of the exalted tribunal was intensified by an awareness that a majority of its members were Southerners, and by the conviction that they had debased themselves, sullied the ermine, by wallowing in the gutter of politics. Southerners, in turn, were inflamed by all this defiance. They began to wonder anew how much longer they could remain joined to a section that refused to honor the Supreme Court to say nothing of the constitutional compact that had established it. So just a quick pause for my crew, anyway. Um, the, after the 1856 election, they said that some things happened that made the North more willing to actually fight, uh, and this was one of the things that enraged the North was the Dred Scott decision, which said that as, as private property, Slaves could be taken anywhere by their masters, including free states, which basically said that slavery could exist anywhere. There's another thing that happened that uh, had a profound effect, probably, on Southern secession. The financial crash of 1857. Bitterness caused by the Dred Scott decision was deepened by hard times, which dampened a period of feverish prosperity. Late in 1856, a panic burst about Buchanan's harassed head. The storm was not so bad economically as the Panic of 1837, but psychologically it was probably the worst of the 19th century. What caused the crash? Importing California gold played its part by helping to inflate the currency. The demands of the Crimean War had overstimulated the growing of grain, while frenzied speculation in land and railroads had further ripped the economic fabric. When the collapse came, over 5,000 businesses failed within a year. Unemployment, accompanied by hunger meetings in urban areas, were widespread. Bread or death stated one desperate slogan. The North, including its grain growers, was hardest hit. The South, enjoying favorable cotton prices abroad, rode out the storm with flying colors. Panic conditions seemed further proof that cotton was king, and that its economic kingdom was stronger than that of the North. This fatal delusion helped drive the overconfident Southerners closer to a shooting showdown. Financial distress in the North, especially in the agriculture, gave a new vigor to the demand for free farms of 160 acres from the public domain. For several decades, interested groups had been urging the federal government to abandon its ancient policy of selling the land for revenue. Instead, the argument ran, acreage should be given outright to the sturdy pioneers as a reward for risking health and life to develop it. A scheme to make outright gifts of homesteads encountered two-pronged opposition. Eastern industrialists had long been unfriendly to free land. Some of them feared that their underpaid workers would be drained off to the West. 
The South was even more bitterly opposed, partly because gang labor slavery could not flourish on a mere 160 acres. Free farms would merely fill up the territories with more rapidly, more rapidly with free soilers and further tip the political balance against the South. In 1860, after years of debate, Congress finally passed a Homestead Act, one that made public lands available at a nominal sum of 25 cents an acre. But the Homestead Act was stabbed to death by the veto pen of President Buchanan, near whose elbow sat leading Southern sympathizers. The Panic of 1857 also created a clamor for higher tariff rates. Several months before the crash, Congress, embarrassed by a large Treasury surplus, had enacted the Tariff of 1857. The new law, responding to pressures from the South, reduced the duties down to about 20% on dutable goods, the lowest point since the War of 1812. Hardly had the revised rates been replaced on the books when financial misery descended like a black pall. Northern manufacturers, many of them Republicans, noisily blamed their misfortune on the low tariff. As the surplus melted away in the Treasury, industrialists in the North pointed to the need for higher duties. But what really concerned them was the desire for increased protection. Thus, the Panic of 1857 gave the Republicans two surefire economic issues for the election of 1860, protection of the unprotected for tariffs and farms for the farmless. So just a quick, again, memory tip, uh, Democrats, D, that's Buchanan is a Democrat, D, they want the tariffs to go down, Republicans are, raise the tariffs, raise the tariffs. An Illinois rail splitter emerges. The Illinois senatorial election of 1856 now claimed the national spotlight. Senator Douglas, turn, his term was about to expire, and the Republicans decided to run against him a rustic Springfield lawyer, one Abraham Lincoln. The Republican candidate, six feet four inches in height and 180 pounds in weight, presented an awkward but arresting figure. Lincoln's legs and arms and neck were grotes grotesquely long. His head was crowned by coarse black and unruly hair, and his face was sad, sunken, and weather beaten. Lincoln was no silver spoon child of the elite. Born in 1809 in a Kentucky log cabin to impoverished parents, he attended a frontier school for not more than a year. Being an avid reader, he was mainly self-educated. All his life, he said, Get thar and heard, I heard. Although narrow-chested and somewhat stoop-shouldered, he shone in his former frontier community as a wrestler and weightlifter, and spent some time, among other pioneering pursuits, as a splitter of logs for fence rails. A superb teller of earthly and amusing stories, he would oddly enough plunge into protracted periods of melancholy. Lincoln's private and professional life was not especially noteworthy. He married above himself socially into the influential Todd family of Kentucky, and the temperamental outbursts of his high-strung wife, known by her enemies as the She-Wolf, helped to school him in patience and forbearance. After reading a little law, he gradually emerged as one of the dozen or so better-known trial lawyers in Illinois. Although still accustomed in carrying important papers in his stovepipe hat, he was widely referred to as Honest Abe, partly because he would refuse cases that he had suspected uh, his conscience to defend. He said he, he, he refused to defend cases that he had to suspend his conscience to defend. The rise of Lincoln as a political figure was less than rock, rocket-like. After making his mark in the Illinois legislature as a Whig politician of the log-rolling variety, he served one undistinguished term in Congress, 1847 to 1849. Until 1854, when he was 45 years of age, he had done nothing to establish a claim to statesmanship. But the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in that year lighted within him unsuspected fires. After mounting the Republican bandwagon, he emerged as one of the foremost politicians and orators of the Northwest. At the Philadelphia Convention of 1856, where John Fremont was nominated, Lincoln actually received 110 votes for the vice presidential nomination. The Great Debate, Lincoln vs. Douglas. Lincoln, as Republican nominee for the Senate seat, boldly challenged Douglas to a series of joint debates. This was a rash act because the stumpy senator was probably the nation's most devastating debater. Douglas promptly accepted Lincoln's challenge, uh, and in seven meetings were arranged for uh, for them in October to uh, August to October in 1858. At first glance, the two contestants seemed ill-matched. The well-groomed and polished Douglas, with bear-like figure and bullhorn voice, presented a striking contrast to the lanky Lincoln, with his baggy clothes and unshined shoes. Moreover, Old Abe, as he was called in both affection and derision, had a piercing, high-pitched voice and was often ill at ease when he began to speak. But as he threw himself into the argument, he seemed to grow in height while his glowing eyes lighted up a rugged face. He relied on logic rather than 
than on table thumping. The most famous debate came at Freeport, Illinois, where Lincoln nearly impaled his opponent on the, home, on the horns of a dilemma. Suppose, he queried, the people of a territory should vote slavery down. The Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision had decreed that the people could not. Who would prevail, the people or the court? Legend to the contrary, Douglas and some Southerners had already publicly answered the Freeport question. The little giant, therefore, did not hesitate to meet the issue head-on, honestly and consistently. He replied to Lincoln's, uh, his reply to Lincoln became known as the Freeport Doctrine. No matter how the Supreme Court ruled, Douglas argued, slavery would stay down if the people voted it down. Laws to protect slavery would have to be passed by the territorial legislators. These would not be forthcoming in the absence of a popular approval, and black bondage would soon disappear. Douglas, in truth, had American history on his side. Where public opinion does not support the federal government, as in the cases of the Jefferson's embargo, the law is almost impossible to enforce. The upshot was that the Douglas defeat, defeated Lincoln for the Senate seat. The Little Giant's loyalty to popular sovereignty, which still had a powerful appeal in Illinois, probably was decisive. Senators were then chosen by state legislators, and in the general election that followed the debates, more pro-Douglas members were elected than pro-Lincoln members. Yet, thanks to inequitable apportionment, the districts carried by Douglas' supporters represented a smaller population than those carried by Lincoln supporters. Honest Abe thus won a clear moral victory. Lincoln possibly was playing for larger stakes than just the senatorship. Although defeated, he had shambled into the national limelight in company with the most prominent northern politicians. Newspapers in the East published detailed accounts of the debates, and Lincoln emerged, began to emerge, as a potential Republican nominee for president. But Douglas, in winning Illinois, winning Illinois, hurt his own chances of winning the presidency while further splitting his splintering party. After his opposition to the Lecompton Constitution for Kansas and his further defiance of the Supreme Court at Freeport, Southern Democrats were determined to break up the party and the Union rather than accept him. The Lincoln-Douglas debate platform thus proved to be one more preliminary battlefield on the Civil War because it seemed to split the Democratic Party north-south. John Brown, Murderer or Martyr The gaunt, grim figure of John Brown of bleeding Kansas infamy now appeared again in an even more terrible way. His crack brain scheme was to invade the South secretly with a handful of followers, call upon the slaves to rise, furnish them with arms, and establish a kind of black free state as a sanctuary. Brown secured several thousand dollars for firearms from northern abolitionists and finally arrived in the hilly West, western Virginia uh, with some twenty men, including several blacks. At scenic Harper's Ferry, he seized the federal arsenal in 1859, incidentally killing seven innocent people, including a free black, and injuring ten or more, or more people. The slaves, largely ignorant of Brown's strike, failed to rise, and the wounded Brown and the remnants of his tiny band were quickly captured by the U.S. Marines under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee. Ironically, within two years, Lee became the preeminent general of the Confederate Army. Old Brown was convicted of murder and treason after a hasty but legal trial. His presumed insanity was supported by affidavits from 17 friends and relatives who were trying to save his neck. Actually, 13 of his near relations were regarded as insane, including his mother and grandmother. Governor Wise of Virginia would have been most wise, so say his critics, if he had only clapped the culprit in the lunatic asylum. But Brown, God's angry man, was given every opportunity to pose and to enjoy martyrdom. Though probably of unsound mind, he was clever enough to see that he was worth much more to the abolitionist cause dangling from a rope than in any other way. His demeanor during the trial was dignified and courageous. His last words, this is a beautiful country, were to become legendary, and, his, and he marched up the scaffold steps without flinching. His conduct was so exemplary, his devotion to freedom so inflexible, that he took on an exalted character, however deplorable his previous record may have been. So the hangman's trap was sprung, and plunged, Brown plunged not into oblivion, but into world fame. A memorable marching song of the impending Civil War ran, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. His soul is marching on. The effects of Harper's Ferry were calamitous. In the eyes of the South, already embittered, Osawatomie Brown was a wholesale murderer and an apostle of treason. Many Southerners asked how could they possibly remain in the Union while a murderous gang of abolitionists were financing armed bands to brown them. Moderate Northerners, including Republican leaders, openly deplored this mad exploit, but the South naturally concluded that the violent abolitionist view was shared by the entire North.
dominated by brown-loving Republicans. Abolitionists and other ardent free soilers were infuriated by Brown's execution. Many of them were ignorant of his bloody past and, e and his even more bloody purposes, and they were outraged because the Virginians had hanged so earnest a reformer who was working for so righteous a cause. On the day of his execution, free soilers centered in the north toiled be told bells, guns, and lowered flags, and held rallies. Hi, buddy. Some spoke of St. John Brown, and the serene Ralph Waldo Emerson compared the new martyr he wrote with Jesus. The gallows became a cross. E.C. Stedman wrote, And old John Brown, also a Tommy Brown, may trouble you more than ever when you've nailed his coffin down. The ghost of the martyred Brown would not be laid to rest. So just a quick pause. Um, after 1856, that election in which the Republicans lost, uh, which would have caused the South to secede, some key events happened that emboldened both sides. You have the Dred Scott decision, you have the crash of 1857, which hit the North harder than the South, making the South feel like Cotton was king. You had the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and you also had the John Brown uh, Harper's Ferry attempt, in which the North was in, emboldened by this, what they called a martyr, but not everybody up there. Uh, some, again, moderates thought he was crazy, and the South, which made uh, John, looked at John Brown and the North as all united against them violently. The Disruption of the Democrats Beyond question, the presidential election of 1860 was the most fateful in American history. On it hung the issue of peace or civil war. Deeply divided, the Democrats met in Charleston, South Carolina, with Douglas, the leading candidate of the northern wing of the party. But the southern fire-eaters regarded him as a traitor as a result of his unpopular stand on the Lecompton Constitution and the Freeport Doctrine. After a bitter wrangle over the platform, the delegates from most of the cotton states walked out. When the remainder could not scrape together the necessary two-thirds vote for Douglas, the entire body dissolved. The first tragic secession was a secession of Southerners from the Democratic National Convention. Departure was becoming habit-forming. <clears throat> the Democrats tried again in Baltimore. This time, the Douglas Democrats, chiefly from the North, were firmly in the saddle. Many of the Cotton State delegates again took a walk, and the rest of the convention enthusiastically nominated their hero. The platform came out squarely for popular sovereignty and as a sop to the South against obstruction of the fugitive slave law by the states. Angered Southern Democrats promptly organized a rival convention in Baltimore in which many of the Northern states were unrepresented. They selected as their leader the stern-jawed Vice President John C. Breckinridge, a man of moderate views from the border state of Kentucky. The platform favored the extension of slavery into the territories and an annexation of slave-populated Cuba. A middle-of-the-road group, fearing for the Union, hastily organized the Constitutional Union Party, sneered at as the Do-Nothing or Old Gentleman's Party. It consisted mainly of former Whigs and Know-Nothings, a veritable gathering of graybeards. Desperately anxious to elect a compromise candidate, they met in Baltimore and nominated for the presidency John Bell of Tennessee. They went into a battle ringing handbells for Bell and waving handbills for the Union, the Constitution, and the enforcement of the laws. A rail splitter splits the Union. Elated Republicans were presented with a heaven-sent opportunity. Scenting victory in the breeze as their opponents split hopelessly, they gathered in Chicago in a huge box-light wooden structure called the Wigwam. William H. Seward was by far the best known of the contenders, but his radical utterances, including his irrepressible conflict speech at Rochester in 1858, had ruined his prospects. His numerous enemies coined the slogan, Success Rather Than Seward. Lincoln, the favorite son of Illinois, was defiantly, I'm sorry, definitely a Mr. Second Best, but he was a stronger candidate because he had made fewer enemies. Overtaking Seward on the third ballot, he was nominated amid scenes of wild excitement. The Republican platform had a seductive appeal for just about every important non-Southern group. For the Free Soilers, non-extension of slavery, number one. For the Northern manufacturers, to a protective tariff. For the immigrants, no abridgment of rights. For the Northwest, a Pacific Railroad. For the West, internal improvements at federal expense. And for the farmers, free homesteads from the public domain. Alluring slogans included, Vote Yourself a Farm, and Land for the Landless. So just to pause, the Republican ticket was non-extension of slavery. Notice, not, a, not abolition, not getting rid of slavery, just non-extension of slavery, one. A protective tariff, two. Three, rights for immigrants, 
for a Pacific Railroad for the West and internal improvements uh, and free homesteads for the public domain for the farmers. Southern secessionists promptly served notice that the election of the baboon Lincoln, the abolitionist rail splitter, would split the Union. In fact, Honest Abe, though hating slavery, was no outright abolitionist. As late as February 1865, he was inclined to favor cash compensation to the owners of freed slaves, but for the time being, he saw fit, perhaps mistakenly, to issue no statements to quiet Southern fears. He had already put himself uh, on record, and fresh statements might stir up fresh antagonisms. As the election campaign ground noisily forward, Lincoln's enthusiasts staged roaring rallies and parades, complete with pitch-dropping, pitch-dripping torches and oilskin capes. They extolled High Old Abe, the woodchopper of the West, and the little giant killer, while groaning dis- dismally for poor little Doug. Enthusiastic little giants and little Dugs retorted with, We want a statesman, not a rail splitter, as president. Douglas himself waged a vigorous speaking campaign, even in the South, and threatened to put the hemp on, on his own hands around the neck of the first secessionist. The return... Returns, breathlessly awaited, proclaimed a sweeping victory for Lincoln, the electoral upheaval of 1860. Awkward Abe Lincoln had run a curious race. To a greater degree than any other holder of the nation's highest office, except John Quincy Adams, he was a minority president. Sixty percent of the voters preferred some other candidate. He was also a sectional president, for in ten southern states where he was not allowed on the ballot, he polled no popular votes. The election of 1860 was virtually two elections, one in the North and the other in the South. South Carolinians rejoiced over Lincoln's victory. They now had their excuse to secede. In winning the North, the rail splitter had split off the South. Douglas, though scraping together only 12 electoral votes, made an impressive showing. Boldly breaking with tradition, he campaigned energetically for himself. Presidential candidates customarily maintain a dignified silence. He drew important strength from all sections and ranked a fairly close second in the popular vote column. In fact, the Douglas, the du- Douglas Democrats and the Breckinridge Democrats together amassed 365,476 more votes than did Lincoln. A myth persists, persists that if the Democrats had only united behind Douglas, they would have triumphed. Yet the cold figures tell a different story. Even if the little giant had received all the electoral votes cast for the, all three of Lincoln's opponents, the rail splitter would have won. 169 to 134, instead of 180 to 123. Lincoln still would have carried the populous states of the North and the Northwest. On the other hand, if the Democrats had not broken up, they could have entered the campaign with higher enthusiasm and better organization, and they might have won. Significantly, the verdict of the ballot box did not indicate a strong sentiment for secession. Breckinridge, while favoring the extension of slavery, was no disunionist. Although the candidate of the fire eaters in the slave states, he pulled fewer than the combined strength of his opponents, Douglas and Bell. Douglas and Bell, even he even failed to carry his own Kentucky. Yet the South, despite its electoral defeat, was not badly off. It still had five to four majority on the Supreme Court. Although the Republicans had elected Lincoln, they controlled neither the Senate nor the House of Representatives. The federal government could not touch slavery in those states where it existed except by a constitutional amendment, and such an amendment could be defeated by one-fourth of the states. The 15 slave states numbered nearly one-half the total, a fact not fully appreciated by Southern firebrands. So the South wasn't in bad shape, despite the fact that Lincoln had won the election. The Secession Exodus But a tragic chain reaction of secession now began to erupt. South Carolina, which had threatened to go out if the sectional Lincoln came in, was as good as his word. Four days after the election of the Illinois baboon by insulting majorities, its legislator voted unanimously to call a special convention. Meeting at Charleston in December of 1860, South Carolina unanimously voted to secede. During the next six weeks, six other states of the Lower South, though somewhat less united, followed the leader over the precipice. Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Four more were to join them later, bringing the total to 11. With the eyes of destiny upon them, the seven seceders, formerly meeting at Montgomery, Alabama, in February 1861, created a government known as the Confederate States of America. As their president, they chose Jefferson Davis, a dignified and austere recent member of the U.S. Senate from Mississippi.
He was a West Pointer and a former cabinet member with wide military and administrative experience, but he suffered from chronic ill health as well as from a frustrated ambition to be a Napoleonic strategist. The crisis, already critical enough, was deepened by the lame duck interlude. Lincoln, although elected president in November of 1860, could not take office until four months later, March 4, 1861. During this period of protracted uncertainty, when he was still a private citizen in Illinois, seven of the eleven deserting states pulled out of the Union. President Buchanan, the aging incumbent, has been blamed for not holding the seceders in the Union by sheer force, for wringing his hands instead of secessionist necks. Never a vigorous man and habitually conservative, he was now nearly 70, and although devoted to the Union, he was surrounded by pro-Southern advisors. As an able lawyer wedded to the Constitution, he did not believe that the Southern states could legally secede, yet he could find no authority in the Constitution from stopping them with guns. Oh, for one hour of Jackson, cried the advocates of the strong-arm tactics. But old Buck Buchanan was not old Hickory, and he was faced with a far more complex and serious problem. One important reason why he did not resort to force was that the tiny standing army of some 15,000 men, then widely scattered, was urgently needed to control the Indians in the West. Public opinion in the North at that time was far from willing to unsheath the sword. Fighting would merely shatter all prospects of adjustment, and until the guns began to boom, there was still a flickering hope of reconciliation rather than a contested divorce. The weakness lay not so much in Buchanan as in the Constitution and in the Union itself. Ironically, when Lincoln became president in March, he essentially continued Buchanan's wait-and-see policy. The Collapse of Compromise Impending bloodshed spurred final and frantic attempts at compromise in the American tradition. The most promising of these efforts was sponsored by Senator James Henry Crittenden of Kentucky, whose shoulders had fallen the mantle, on whose shoulders had fallen the mantle of his fellow Kentuckian Henry Clay. The proposed Crittenden amendments to this Constitution were designed to appease the South. Slavery in the territories was to be prohibited north of 3630, but south of that line it was to be given federal protection in all territories existing or hereafter to be acquired, such as Cuba. Future states north or south of the 3630 could come into the Union with or without slavery as they choose. In short, the slavery supporters were to be guaranteed full rights in the southern territories as long as they were territories, regardless of the wishes of the majority under popular sovereignty. Federal protection in a territory south of 3630 might conceivably, uh, though improbably, turn the entire area permanently to slavery. Lincoln flatly rejected the contendent scheme, which offered some slight prospects of success, and all hope of compromise evaporated. For this refusal, he must bear a heavy responsibility. Yet, he had been elected on a platform that opposed the extension of slavery, and he felt that as a matter of principle, he could not afford to yield, even though gains for slavery in the territories might only be temporary. Larger gains might come later in Cuba and Mexico. Pretendant's proposal, said Lincoln, would amount to a perpetual covenant of war against every people, tribe, and state owning a foot of land between here and the Tierra de Fuego, which is the southern tip of South America. As for the su- supposedly spineless old fogey Buchanan, how could he have prevented the civil war by starting a civil war? No one has yet come up with a satisfactory answer. If he had refused If he had used force on South Carolina in December of 1860, the fighting almost certainly would have erupted three months sooner than it did, and under less favorable circumstances for the Union. The North would have appeared as a heavy-handed aggressor, and the crucial border states so vital to the Union probably would have been driven into the arms of their wayward sisters. Farewell to Union. Secessionists who parted company with their sister states left for a number of avowed reasons, mostly related in some way to slavery. They were alarmed by the inexorable tipping of the political balance against them, the despotic majority of numbers. The crime of the North, observed James Russell Lowell, was the census returns. Southerners were also dismayed by the triumph of the new sectional Republican Party, which seemed to threaten their right as a slaveholding minority. They were weary of free soil criticism, abolitionist nagging, and northern interference, ranging from the Underground Railroad to John Brown's raid. All we ask is to be let alone, declared Confederate President Jefferson Davis in an early message to his Congress. Many Southerners supported secession because they felt sure that their departure would be unopposed, despite Yankee yawp to the contrary. They were confident that the clod-hopping and cod-fishing Yankee would not or could not fight. They believed that northern manufacturers and bankers, so heavily dependent on southern cotton and markets, would not dare to cut their own economic throats with their own unionist swords. 
But should war come, the immense debt owed to northern creditors by the South, happy thought, could be promptly repudiated, as it later was. Southern leaders regarded the secession as a golden opportunity to cast aside their generations of vassalage to the North. An independent Dixieland could develop its own banking and shipping and trade directly with Europe. The, the low tariff of 1857, passed largely by Southern votes, was not itself menacing. But who could tell them... Who could tell when the greedy Republicans would win control of Congress and drive through their own oppressive protective tariff? For decades, this fundamental friction had pitted the North with its manufacturing plants against the South, with its agricultural exports. Worldwide impulses of nationalism, then stirring in Italy, Germany, Poland, and elsewhere, were fermenting in the South. This huge area with its distinctive culture was not so much a section as a subnation. It could now view with complacency the possibility of being lorded over, then or later, by what it regarded as a hostile nation of northerners. It could not view that with complacency. The principles of self-determination, of the Declaration of Independence, seemed to many southerners to apply perfectly to them. Few, if any, of the seceders felt that they were doing anything wrong or immoral. The 13 original states had voluntarily entered the Union, and now seven, ultimately 11, southern states were voluntarily withdrawing from it. Historical parallels ran even deeper. In 1776, 13 American colonies, led by the rebel George Washington, had seceded from the British Empire by throwing off the yoke of King George III. In 1860 and 61, 11 American states, led by the rebel Jefferson Davis, were seceding from the Union by throwing off the yoke of King Abraham Lincoln. With that burden gone, the South was confident that it could work out its own peculiar destiny more quietly, happily, and prosperously. Varying viewpoints. The Civil War, repressible or irrepressible? Few topics have generated as much controversy among American historians as the causes of the Civil War. The very names employed to describe the conflict, notably Civil War or War Between the States, or even War for Southern Independence, reveal much about the various authors' points of view. Interpretations of the great conflict have naturally differed according to section and have been charged with emotional and moral fervor. Yet despite long and keen interest in the origin of the conflict, the causes of the Civil War remain as passionately debated today as they were a century ago. The so-called nationalist school of the late 19th century, typified in the work of historian James Ford Rhodes, claimed that slavery caused the Civil War. Defending the necessity and inevitability of the war, these northern-oriented historians credited the conflict with ending slavery and preserving the Union. But in the early 20th century, progressive historians, led by Charles and Mary Beard, presented a more skeptical interpretation. The Beards argued that the war was fought not over slavery, per se, but rather a deeply rooted economic struggle between the industrial North and an agricultural South. Anointing the Civil War the Second American Revolution, the Beards claimed that the war precipitated vast changes in American class relations and shifted the political balance of power by magnifying the influence of business magnates and industrialists while destroying the plantation aristocracy of the South. Shaken by the disappointing results of World War I and a new wave, a new wave of historians argued that the Civil War II had actually been a big mistake. Rejecting the nationalist interpretation that the clash was inevitable, James, J., James G. Randall and Avery Craven asserted that the war had been a repressible conflict. Neither slavery nor the economic differences between North and South were sufficient causes for war. Instead, Craven and others attributed the bloody confrontation to the breakdown of political institutions, the passion of overzealous reformers, and the ineptitude of a blundering generation of political leaders. Following the Second World War, however, a neo-nationalist view regained authority, echoing the earlier views of Rhodes in depicting the Civil War as an unavoidable conflict between two societies. One slave and one free. For Alan Nevins and David M. Potter, irreconcilable differences in morality, politics, culture, social values, and economies increasingly eroded the ties between the sections and inexorably set the United States on the road to civil war. Eric Foner and Eugene Genovese have emphasized each section's nearly paranoid fear that the survival of its distinctive way of life was threatened by the expansion of the other section. In Free Soil, Free Men, Free Labor, Foner emphasized that most Northerners detested slavery not because it enslaved blacks, but because its existence, and its particularly its rapid extension, threatened the position of free white laborers. This free labor ideology increasingly became the foundation stone upon which the North claimed its superiority over the South. Eugene Genovese has argued that the South felt similarly endangered. Convinced that the Southern labor system was more humane than the Northern factory system, Southerners saw Northerners design, designs to destroy their way of life lurking at every turn and every territorial battle. Some historians have placed 
party politics at the center of for their explanations for the war. For them, no event was more consequential than the breakdown of the Jacksonian party system. When the slavery issue tore apart both the Democratic and the Whig parties, the last ligaments binding the nation came together. The, the, binding the nation together snapped, and war inevitably came. More recently, historians of the ethnocultural school, especially Michael Holt, have acknowledged the significance of the collapse of the established parties, but have offered a different analysis on how to break down how the breakdown led to war. They note that the two great national parties before the 1850s focused attention on issues such as the tariff, banking, and internal improvements, thereby muting sectional differences over slavery. According to this argument, the erosion of the traditional party system is blamed not on growing differences over slavery, but on a temporary consensus between the two parties in the 50, 1850s on almost all national issues other than slavery. In this peculiar political atmosphere, the slavery issue rose to the fore, encouraging the emergence of Republicans in the North and secessionists in the South. In the absence of regular, national two-party conflict over economic issues, purely regional parties like the Republicans coalesced. They identified their opponents not simply as competitors for power, but as threats to their way of life and even to the republic itself.